We are back in John 17. Can you hear me? Sorry. Back in John 17, we're slowly working our way through the book. If you remember last week, we looked at verses, I believe it was 9 through 12. And one of the biggest conclusions we made was that Jesus, if you see right there in verse 11, is praying for the unity of believers. Right at the very end of that verse, he asks the Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And if you remember, right at the very end, we were talking about just how staggering that is, that Christ would ask that believers have the same unity that the triune holy God has, that we would be as unified as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are. And I kind of challenged us to think, are we uh, contributing to that unity in our church? Are we rallying around the right things? Or are we contributing to a spirit of disunity? Are we um, just coming to church, operating in the body in a role that is not, that really is just doing more harm than good? And this evening, we're going to look at why the unity of believers is so important. So let's read together just three verses, verses 13 to 15. And we're going to see why it is that believers must have unity. John 17, verse 13, it says, but now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And you can see right there in verse 14, what it is that is so important, why believers must have this unity. Jesus says, the world has hated them. There's really no more succinct way to put that. The world does not like believers. And that is what a good chunk of our time is going to be spent on this evening, probably half of it, but we would be remiss if we did not look at verse 13. And it might be one of those verses that we just kind of see as a transition into the meat of verses 14 and 15. And yet I think that this is actually a precursor to why or what our attitude or our outlook must be as we are in the world. Verse 13, Jesus says, but now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You see, Jesus speaking about this coming conflict, about the world hating them, realizes that the disciples, they need a supernatural joy to keep them through these hard times. And if the disciples are looking to the acceptance of the world to help them persevere and to make it through the calling that Jesus has called them to, that's not going to provide any real joy or satisfaction or meaning to them. They need Christ's joy. Jesus calls it my joy. And you know, sometimes as Christians, we know a lot about the fact that we should possess this joy. It's one of the fruits of the spirit. We could probably recite some verses about joy. We know, you know, at least on paper that the world doesn't offer joy, that really that joy comes from knowing God. And yet perhaps you sitting here even on a Wednesday evening and that joy is just missing from your heart. And perhaps you've not tasted that joy in a while, that in the midst of the grind of everyday life, you've become a little bit hopeless, that you're certainly feeling the antagonism of the world, and yet you would examine your own heart, your own life, and, and realize, maybe I don't possess the joy that Jesus is speaking about here in verse, th verse 13. And so the obvious question then for us is, so where do we get this joy? How, how do we reclaim the joy that should be ours as believers in Christ? Are there any clues in verse 13 here for us? Let's look at it closely. Jesus says, these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And so if you're looking carefully there in the text, you see that it is these things that Jesus is speaking that should bring that joy. 
Now a closer evaluation of the text, because these things is not very specific at all. I mean, just saying the words, these things gives no one joy. But if we were to evaluate, what is Jesus talking about? What are these things? Perhaps it is right there in the context of verse 13, right at the beginning, Jesus says, but now I am coming to you. Maybe it's Jesus's departure from this world and his entrance into his father's presence, his glorification that is supposed to bring the disciples joy. And I think that's certainly possible, but I wonder if it's these things speaking of Jesus's teachings on earth that are supposed to bring the disciples joy. Turn back with me, if you will, and look at chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. We're going to see this phrase repeated in verse 11, but we'll start in verse 9. Jesus is speaking, and he says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you. Do you see, we just read that in chapter 17. Jesus says, I'm speaking these things that you might have joy. Jesus says here in in chapter 15, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And so according to this text, how is it that we capture Jesus's joy? Well, it's by obeying his commandments. And verse 12 elaborates on those commandments. And he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so one of the ways that we can possess this joy is to love other people. We see in verses 9 to 11, this other idea of Jesus abiding in the Father And Jesus encouraging us to abide in him. And we're starting to piece together now all of these different ideas that help us to capture true Christ-like joy. You know, we mentioned at the very beginning, perhaps that it is Christ's glorification that brings joy. And other texts speak of this. Jesus tells his disciples in John 14, you know, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced that I was going to be with the Father. Hebrews talks about the joy that was set before Christ that allowed him to endure suffering because he knew he was going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And I would argue that the glorified Christ, the risen Christ, who is, as we looked at last week, interceding on our behalf, should be the cause for joy in our life. And yet, even as chapter 15 is showing us this idea of abiding in Christ, of loving one another, of obeying the teachings of Christ, I think that there is also joy that can be found and just the word of God and an obedience to it. And I want to pause here and I want to ask us this evening, are the teachings of Christ, is the word of God, Christ's status as glorified in the Father's presence, are those things producing a joy in us today? And by joy, I don't mean like some wishy-washy, like kind of cloud nine experience where we're like, yay, you know, I'm just happy today. But I mean a deep rooted confidence and a hope and a belief that what God's word says is true and that you can bank on it, that there is a satisfaction that comes not from waking up and feeling good one day or waking up and feeling a little lonely and depressed, but there is a deep rooted joy in knowing Christ and abiding in him and letting his words, the truths contained within them, bring you joy. You see, if like Christ, our joy is, re- is rooted rather in our relationship to the father, then we'll never lose that joy. Christ went to the cross still possessing the joy because he knew that he was doing the will of the father. And we can have joy and similar beliefs. I wrote a couple down here this evening. Colossians 2, 14. We can have joy in the belief that our record of debt that stood against us was set aside and it was nailed to the cross. Does that give you joy? And I'm not asking you this evening to necessarily, you know, nod along just knowingly and try to manufacture this joy, but in the quietness of your heart, does the fact that you have been forgiven of your sins 
bring you a measure of comfort, a measure of joy that your circumstances cannot quench. Like Romans 8 talks about, you being an heir with Christ Jesus, does that give you joy? That we are eternally secure, that nothing can pluck us from the Father's hands, that the curse of sin has been defeated and Christ will return to reign victorious. Do these things give you joy? We're in John 17. Look back at John 16, verse 33. Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Does Jesus overcoming the world, as we looked at a couple weeks ago as a resurrection Sunday, does Jesus overcoming the power of death, the curse of sin, does that give you a joy And again, it's not necessarily one that just results in you being like giddy, but one that is just a confidence, uh, an indifference to your circumstances because you know that your eternity is secure, that your standing before God is as a son, not a stranger, not an illegitimate child, but you are a son of God. Do those things give you joy in your darkest of days, those spiritual realities? You know, I love... It is well with my soul, that song. And you cannot help but belt out, I think it's verse three, when the the hymn writer says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Does that give you a joy that you can just bank on, that you can build your life upon without worry of what is happening in the day-to-day. But, however, if our joy is dependent on the, world's acceptance, on the world's acceptance of us, then we are setting ourselves up to be majorly let down. And this is where verse 14 comes into play. If we are looking to the world to give us purpose and meaning, then when we, were, then when we read verse 14... I have given them your word and the world has hated them, then we're in trouble because the world is not our friend. They are our enemy. And hated here is a strong word. It's not just like uh, the world will dislike you or the world will kind of look at your preferences or the way you live your life with uh, indifference or just a tolerance of it. No, the world will hate you. It is this hatred that led to Stephen's stoning in Acts chapter seven. It is this hatred of the disciples that led to their martyrdom. It is this hatred of the very son of God that led the Jews to kill him. It is this hatred of Christianity that even today leads to believers all around the world being persecuted for their faith. You don't imprison or kill or persecute people that you just kind of tolerate or you just kind of dislike. No, you imprison and torture and kill people that you hate. And why is it that there is such hostility between us and the world? Verse 14 tells us, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And it's a small little world, a small little word there. And it's the word of. You know, we are certainly in the world. That is obvious to us. We can't get out of the world. But Jesus is saying that you are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And that means that we are fundamentally not a part of this world, that our origins are different. Our master is different. Our purpose and our values, our philosophy is different in complete contrast to that of the world. Peter calls us sojourners and exiles in this world. The author of Hebrews, in uh, Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, he says that those heroes that are spoken about, they were strangers and they were exiles on earth, but they desired a heavenly country. The men in Hebrews 11 that we 
you know, just look to as the models of faithfulness are called strangers and exiles. And they looked for a world that was to come, the heavenly world, because they knew this is not our home. And what is it that is the distinguishing characteristic between us and the world? I think it's found in verse 14 again, that first, that first phrase there. I have given them your word. And it is the word of God which sets us apart from the world. You see, 1 John 2 describes the philosophy of this world as people who desire the flesh, the desire what their eyes see. It is the pride of life that is dominating their perspective. And that is condemned as the world's philosophy, that what they can see, what they can handle, the things that they can possess, that is what the world is striving after. And yet we know conversely that this stands in direct opposition to God's expectations for our life, does it not? We're supposed to have an eternal perspective. We believe things that the world just fundamentally does not. We believe that there's a creator and not that there's just a creator, but that we are accountable to him, that we can't just live life willy nilly, however we want and expect no consequences for our actions, but we believe that there is a God who is holy and he has expectations and standards by which we must live by and which we, which we must subject ourselves to. And we are accountable to that God. We believe that we are not inherently good people, that we are sinful, that we are wicked creatures. And the world thinks, yeah, man's basically good. I can live how I want. And scripture tells us at a fundamental level that we are not of the world. We serve a different master and our lives stand in stark contrast to them. And it is the ruler of this world, Satan, who we're going to read about in just a minute, that is influencing the minds of the lost world around us. And it is Satan who is furthering his own agenda and the lives of unbelievers. Jesus here in this verse even self-identifies as not being of this world. Look at the end of verse 14. He says, they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Back in John 15, Jesus says, the world hated me before it hated you. First Peter, I believe, talks about expecting to suffer like Christ did. You see, they don't just hate us. They hate our Lord. And it is from the top down a hatred, a despising of Christianity that the world, that's how they view us. And so what is Christ's request in light of this hostility, in light of the world hating us? How does Christ pray? Look at verse 15. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And this is a really interesting request if you think about it, because Jesus here is not asking for our lives to be easy. He's not saying, yeah, just take them out so they can avoid hardship and they can avoid the world hating them. Imagine if at the moment of our conversion, we were just immediately in the presence of God. Well, then we would never suffer persecution. There would be no grind of the Christian life. And Jesus he knows that we have a mission. We have a purpose. It is to be ambassadors, ambassadors in this world. It is to evangelize the lost. And so Jesus is saying here in verse 15, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. We still have a mission here and it's gonna be hard, but what is Jesus asking for? But that you keep them from the evil one. And who do we think the evil one is in this text? Not that hard to guess, Satan, right? Satan, in Revelation 12, referred to as the accuser of the brethren. And this is the king of this world that scripture talks about, whose goal, whose purpose is to thwart God's plan, to compromise believers' testimonies, to disrupt our effectiveness from the gospel. And if you want evidence of just how destructive Satan can be, 
Look at verse 12. We looked at this last week. The very end of verse 12, not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. And you know who scripture says inhabited the son of destruction? The evil one, Satan. And Satan can use Judas to send Christ to the cross. But even in that, there's not defeat, right? And even in Jesus's prayer here, we see that there is a very simple truth in the phrase, keep them from the evil one. And that truth is that God can do it. That God can keep us from this evil one. That Satan is operating on borrowed authority. That even our mortal enemy, the one whose mission it is to thwart us and to cause us to be compromised for the sake of the gospel can be kept from us. That God does restrict him, that he has boundaries. And I think that in a similar way, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 familiar passage kind of speaks to this almost, where we're reminded that no temptation has overtaken us, but God is faithful and he will not let us be tempted above that which we are able, but he will with that temptation also make a way of escape so that we can bear it. And, and I just think that this is a corresponding truth to the evil one being kept from us that we can say no to temptation, that we can escape his grasp, that we should also be praying like Jesus did in the Lord's prayer, deliver us from evil. We can't escape this world, but we can escape temptation. We can not escape our enemy with the Lord's help. And so just a couple questions tonight in closing, but I ask, what is the source of our joy? We looked at this at the beginning of this evening. Is it our circumstances? Because if our joy is so tied up in our circumstances, then scripture, when it guarantees us that we are going to suffer, guarantees that we are going to be miserable people. That is expected. If you're a Christian, you're going to face hardship. And so if our joy is captured in the world, then we should be looking at a pretty sorry life. But if our joy is rooted and grounded in God's word, in our relationship with that God, with God's sovereignty and truths that are just unfathomable to the believer, then we will have a joy, a peace, like Philippians talks about, that passes all understanding that when sickness and financial stress and the cares of this life, even the prospect of death, when those are at our doorstep, we aren't miserable people. We aren't succumbing to our circumstances for our happiness, but we find our identity and our purpose in our position in Christ. And secondly, I think it's appropriate to ask, does the world hate you? Jesus says to expect it. The world hates them. And I think it'd be good for us to ask ourselves, does the world hate me? Now, obviously I'm not asking us to go out and make the world hate us where we just do like annoying things to them and they're like, oh, I hate Christians. No, but is you, are you living your life in such a distinct way that it stands in complete contrast to the values of this world. And there are some easy ones, right? Abortion, I don't think any of us would give our stamp of approval to that and the world does. And so there's a point of contention between us. But I think perhaps a better question that we should be asking ourselves rather than does the world hate us is are you of the world? kind of rephrasing what Jesus said, that we are not of the world. That's the expectation. And I would ask, are you of the world? Have the world's values become yours?
you see, we live in a country that was founded on Christian principles and it's actually pretty easy to live um, in accordance with God's law at times because our laws match up pretty well with God's for the most part. And so I think this goes a little bit deeper than that where when we speak of being of the world, I've said it a couple of times already, but do we think of ourselves as exiles, strangers, sojourners in this world? Or do we, are, or do we see ourselves as actually pretty comfy? That life is pretty cush here. And the values that the world has of a nice little nest egg when you retire and comfort and seeking your own best, Perhaps those things have creeped into our lives where we're actually more like the world than we would like to admit. And I would challenge you to be distinct, to live in such a way that the world notices the difference. And I'm not asking you to necessarily instigate hatred or to get excited about it, but when those things happen, be confident that you are living in a way that would bring glory to Christ that Christians are going to suffer persecution for being different. And that's a good thing in some ways because we are then truly living out what Christ has called us to be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this text. And I thank you that there's a lot of truth packed into these couple of verses here that Christ knowing our plight, knowing the oppression and the hostility that we would face does not ask for us to be alleviated of that. Instead, he prays that you would help us to persevere, that you'd keep Satan from us, Lord. And I just ask that even tonight, you would change our hearts so that we would not become like the world, that we would not put all of our eggs in the basket of the world's values. It helps to be different and distinct that you would give us a joy that is not rooted in our circumstances, but is Christ's joy, the joy that can be confident in our position before you as sons, as heirs, as having eternal life and our sins forgiven. Lord, you know that we are weak, that our minds often stray. And I just ask that even these truths, these principles would be reverberating around in our minds for days to come. And that when things get challenging, as we know they will, we would find a joy in our position as children of God. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.